So we are about to see the second keynote of this conference. I am very happy to introduce to you Teresa Johnson, who has been doing some really great work on thin LTO, and I've um, been you know looking for for some talk in that direction. Uh, which is not like directly centric about C++ features, but talks about the tooling which is behind it and goes in a bit of a depth on, on techni techniques which are now new or innovative. And I think uh, thin LTO de definitely plays in that field. So I'm really looking forward to this keynote. Um, Teresa, please take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, yes. Okay, great. So um, hi, I'm Teresa Johnson. I'm from Google. And, and today I'll be talking about uh, ThinLTO, uh, which is a thin link time optimization framework. Um, and we'll get into what that means in a few minutes. Uh, but the important thing is that ThinLTO enables scalable and incremental whole program optimization. Um, so just some history here. Uh, this was proposed by my colleague David Lee and myself um, some years ago at Euro LLVM. Um, and uh, we got engaged with the community and ended up uh, collaborating with Media Mini, who at the time was at Apple, um, to refine the design and develop this upstream in LLVM. Um, and so the first release in LLVM was the next year, 2016. Um, and it's supported by essentially all the linkers that you would use with uh, Clang. It's also, I don't have it on the list here, but it's also supported by the GNU linker. Um, through the same plugin that we use for gold. Um, it's not regularly tested by LLVM upstream, but I'm told that that works as well. Uh, so since then, um, this has been improved over time. We're continuing to improve it. Um, and I'm really happy that there's a, now actually a fair number of contributors to the thin LTO optimization framework in the LLVM community. Um, and we have also have uh, since then enabled this by default for Google's production builds. Um, so today, I'm going to start by going through some background information um, to talk about why LTO, uh, why link time optimization is important and what it, what it is, um, and also why we needed to design a thin version of LTO. Um, and then I'll describe the thin LTO compilation model. Um, and then I'm going to go into some newer material that talks about how we've integrated this with our build system um, and some of the learnings we've um, had from deploying this widely across Google. Um, and then finally, I want to go through some of the newer optimizations uh, developed for thin LTO and where we're going in the future. Okay, so let's start out by looking at a traditional compilation. Um, this is O2 with no LTO, and each source file is compiled down to native objects, uh, going through the front end processing, optimizations on the compiler's IR, and then code generation. Um, and this is done. Um, completely, you can do it completely in parallel. Each translation unit gets compiled independently of the others. Um, and then finally, they're linked. So for regular LTO, uh, we're going to do more optimization at link time. And in order to facilitate that, we now need to keep around LLVM's IR, which is called bit code. Um, and so we remove the code generation from the first compile step for each source file. Uh, so you still go through some initial optimizations. Uh, we generate object files that actually contain IR now. And when these are passed off to the linker, the linker recognizes that they're bit code, passes them off to LVM, which then merges all of the IR into a single large module. And now that we have a single module, we can do just the normal optimization pipeline on it, um, code generate it into a native object, um, and do a very simple link. And this is called a monolithic LTO implementation because we have combined all of the IR into a monolithic module. Uh, the reason why you would want to do this, well, number one, uh, it can give you a, a really nice performance boost. Uh, by merging all of the IR, we have removed the module boundaries or the translation unit boundaries, um, and we can get cross-module optimization. And so a lot of the benefit comes from being able to inline functions that were originally in different translation units now across those module boundaries that no longer exist. Um, additionally, you also get some binary size improvements. Um, 
the linker provides information to LLVM about which symbols are needed outside of the linkage unit, um, outside of the LTO unit, and the rest of the symbols can be internalized. And this facilitates um, things like dead stripping, um, auto hidden visibility, things that can reduce the binary size quite nicely. Interestingly, um, if you look at even single source code benchmarks with LTO, we get a performance improvement. Um, and this again is due to the linker information about which symbols can be internalized. Once you've internalized, for example, global variables, we can do much better um, and much more aggressive optimization. So for this reason, an LTO build is more powerful than a Unity build, which refers to merging all of your source code together before going through the compiler um, because of that linker supplied information. Um, but you know, LLVM has had an LTO implementation for a while, but it was never really widely adopted. Um, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, it's inherently serial. Uh, you can't parallelize or distribute the LTO compilation um, because you're merging everything into a monolithic module and then just going through the normal optimization pipeline, it's, uh, it ends up being quite slow. So you can see here, uh, comparing a non-LTO build of the Clang binary to an LTO build of the Clang binary, um, LTO is, is significantly slower. This gets even worse when you look at incremental compiles. If you fix a single source, if you change a single source, source code uh, line, you have to redo the entire monolithic LTO uh, build. Whereas when you're building with O2, you just simply recompile that one file and do your native link. So there's, it's, it's significantly slower for incremental builds. Um, also, because we're merging all of the IR together and holding it all in memory, it's inherently memory hungry. Um, so there was some work over time to try to reduce the memory overhead of LTO. Um, but in the end, the, you sort of hit diminishing returns because you're fundamentally keeping all of the IR for the whole program in memory. So when we look at larger applications like Chromium, um, especially with debug info, which bloats out your IR even more, you can't build them with monolithic LTO at all. So in order to have an LTO uh, implementation that we can use widely, we really want something that is parallel, incremental, and memory lean. So we uh, basically designed uh, a new LTO approach from the ground up around those three key principles in order to uh, be able to use LTO um, much more widely. So if we look at uh, the thin LTO design at a really high level, uh, the way we want to do this is to have, uh, we want to have parallel, not only parallel compiles to object files, um, to the IR object files, but we also want to have parallel backends during the LTO portion of the compile. Um, this is not only to get single machine parallelism, but also to take advantage of distributed build systems. Um, in order to have incremental builds, we want to keep the module as the unit of compilation. And in order to keep the LTO process memory lean, we only want to perform profitable cross-module optimizations into each of those modules so that they remain relatively, relatively small. Um, and as you'll see when I go through the details, the way that we do that with, with thin LTO is to have a thin serial synchronization step um, to coordinate all of this. Uh, so thin LTO is, uh, a thin LTO build has three phases. So the first phase is the compile step, which looks very much like it would for traditional regular LTO. Um, we are compiling source files in parallel down to LLVM IR. Um, but for thin LTO, we've added um, on the side of the IR an additional summary that uh, basically summarizes all of the functions and the variables defined in the module um, and the, the references and calls uh, made by those, those uh, functions and variables. So we end up with a local reference and call graph. Um, and for incremental compiles, which I'll talk about later, we also include a hash of the module's IR. 
Um, so for example, let's say we have two modules, foo.o and bar.o. Um, so let's say in foo.o, there's a function foo that's defined. So we summarize how many instructions it has, the calls that it makes. Um, so for example, foo calls bar, which is not defined in foo.o. Um, that's defined in bar.o, which then has an entry for bar summarizing how many instructions it has, its linkage type, and uh, other information. Um, the second phase of a thin LTO build is the thin link. Um, so this is going to link together only the summaries into a giant index. Um, it's not parsing the IR at all. Um, and once we've linked together these summaries, we end up with a full reference and call graph for the entire application. And we can use this to perform interprocedural analysis across the whole program. Um, and then we do some analysis and we generate these analysis results for each module. So for example, for foo.o, we see that we have a call from foo to bar um, and we realize <clears throat> bar is a small function. It would probably be inlined by the compiler if we had the definition available. So the analysis re results might say we should import bar from bar.o into, into foo.o. Um, we'll also include other results like linkage type changes. Um, for example, when we want to internalize variables, um, we put the new linkage for each symbol in the analysis results. Uh, this is a serial phase, but because we're not looking at IR at all, it's very, very fast. Uh, so uh, for example, for the Clang binary, the, the thin link takes a few seconds. Um, the third phase of the of an LTO build are the backends. And here we are going to be applying the analysis results to each module in parallel and independently. So for foo.o, we see the, the analysis result says we should import bar from bar.o. Um, and LLVM IR has a mechanism to parse individual functions out um, very efficiently. So we simply parse out that function, merge it into foo.o. Um, and the important thing to note here is that those imported functions, we keep them around just long enough to get through inlining and then they're dropped. Um, we don't need to code gen them because we know that we uh, have a definition for them somewhere else. And this proceeds in parallel for every single module. And then once we've done, we're done applying the analysis results, each module goes through you know, the traditional normal optimization pipeline, code generation, um, and in the end, we have native objects that are just linked together. Um, if you do a thin LTO build on a single machine, um, all of this happens transparently within the link process. So all of these backends are threads that the linker um, spawns. And it, spawn, it looks at basically how many CPUs your machine has, and it, it decides how, many, how much parallelism to do um, when it's firing off those threads. For distributed builds, so in Google, we have a distributed build system that we want to take advantage of. So for that, we have to actually break this apart into different processes. So we have one process doing the thin link and then one process per thin LTO backend. Um, and to facilitate that, we now have to stream out those analysis results for every module to a file. Um, in addition to that, we also emit per file um, the list of other modules that we're going to be importing functions from. And this is used by the build system because it needs to know which objects to package up and send to the remote build machine for each backend process. Um, so we, the build system launches each of these backend jobs to, potentially to a different remote node, uh, sends off the analysis results, packages up the necessary IR object files to all of them. And then once we've done that, now we can apply those interprocedural transformations for each module completely in parallel in a distributed fashion. And then finally, the native objects get sent to another process that just does a, a native link. So for incremental builds, um, as I mentioned earlier, the summaries also contain a hash of each um, module's IR. So when, if we make a, a change to a single source file, we have to rebuild that source file down to a new IR object that has this, a new summary. And we have to redo the, the thin link, but again, that's quite fast. Um, and then the analysis results, 
that file contains not only the analysis results uh, and the transformations that will apply based on them, but it also includes the hash of that module and the hash of any module that we'll be importing from. And so essentially that analysis results file encapsulates all the information needed to make an incremental build decision. Um, so we can uh, compute a hash of that input file, look it up in our cache system. And if we have a matching uh, entry, we simply use that native object and completely suppress the corresponding LTO backend. And we never need to load the IR at all for that backend. Um, inside Google, we use a build system called Bazel. It's open source and um, it supports distributed builds. So the way Bazel works is that it looks at the dependency graph um, based on the build files um, specified for the source code that we use, and it computes what's called an action graph. And it does this ahead of time. It basically computes a graph of all of the actions, the build actions that will be needed, um, and connects them by the inputs and outputs. Um, and so one thing to note here is that inside Bazel, um, the thin link is called the LTO indexing action. Um, so here I've shown an action graph for a small thin LTO build. Um, and the way that um, this then executes is uh, basically you walk through the action graph and each action can be sent to a potentially a different remote build node. Um, and it's sent as soon as all of its inputs are ready. Uh, so for the LTO backends, as I mentioned, we have these import lists that indicate which object files we need um, because we'll be importing from them. So once we've com um, completed the LTO, LTO indexing uh, action, those import lists are sent to the corresponding LTO backend actions and they're used to basically prune and set up the uh, uh, input edges uh, that we'll need for each backend action. The other thing to note about uh, Bazel is that the caching is content-based. Um, it's a hash of the inputs. And so this fits in perfectly with how we can do uh, incremental builds with an LTO. Um, because that uh, analysis results file is one of the inputs to the, the LTO backend, we hash it, we include that in the hash when we look up whether we need to actually um, perform that LTO backend or not. Okay, so let's go back to uh, the thin LTO whole program optimization model. Um, a key point of the design is that any optimizations added need to be split into two distinct phases. So the first is an analysis phase um, that happens during the thin link, and this operates only on the summaries. It needs to be set up so that you don't have to look at IR at all, that all the information you need is in the summary, and then the results are recorded in that combined index that's built. And then there's a second part where we now have to apply those analysis results to the IR. And so we need to be able to look up the results in the analysis, um, look up the information in the analysis results, and apply them to each backend independently. Um, this is sort of the key uh, to how the NLTO can be uh, support both massive scaling and very fast incremental builds. Okay, so I just want to go through a list of some example whole program optimizations that have been implemented for thin LTO. Um, and I want to note that uh, these have been contributed by multiple people working in LVM upstream. Um, the first that I've already talked about is function importing. Um, this was uh, implemented in the initial uh, design of, and implementation of thin LTO. Uh, because again, inlining is so important for, for performance, and we want to enable cross-module inlining. One of the other things that we did um, early on also was to integrate the NLTO with profile guided optimization. Um, so we use profile information to guide function importing. Um, we want to aggressively import functions that are hot and not import things that are cold um, because that fits in well with how the inliner will behave. Um, additionally, LVM's profile guided optimization has support for speculative divirtualization. So when you have indirect calls, and you collect profile information. It also collects um, the list of the frequently um, the, the frequent targets of each indirect call. Um, and then when you feed that back, 
uh, LLVM will speculatively virtualize those calls. And we've integrated this within LTO so that we can now do cross-module speculative divirtualization. Um, more recently, someone contributed support to do constant read-only global variable importing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's support for doing internalization based on linker information um, that enables code size improvements and also more aggressive optimization. Um, also using linker information, we can prune uh, dead globals that don't reach anything um, that escapes the module. Um, another thing we can do based on linker information uh, is called weak linkage resolution. So in C++, when you have template function definitions, um, if you haven't done explicit instantiation, you have to have that template function definition in your header because every use of that template function needs to have a copy of the definition. Um, so the way this works in a non-LTL compile is that you end up with multiple copies of those template function definitions in your objects. They have weak linkage and the, the linker picks one and basically discards the rest. Um, because we have linker information during the thin link, we know which copy will be prevailing, which copy the linker chose to keep. And we mark all of the others so that once we get past inlining, we can simply discard them. And what this means is that we have significantly fewer functions going through code generation. And also a nice benefit that we've seen is that we have significantly smaller object files going into the native link. Um, I'll talk later about whole program divirtualization. And there's a number of others um, under uh, development and review. Uh, so for example, some folks at Facebook have contributed patches to do similar function merging across modules within LTO. Um, and this gives a nice code size improvement. So I want to show some uh, build time uh, results for an LTO. And I want to compare not only to LLVM's monolithic LTO, but it's also interesting to compare against GCC's LTO. Um, and the reason is that GCC has a very sophisticated LTO implementation um, that's also divided into two parts. So it also has a serial part that makes IPA and inlining decisions, and it uses the IR to do this. And then it, at the end, it rewrites out partitioned IR. And that partitioned IR is used to drive parallel backends that actually perform the inlining and then the rest of the optimization and code generation. So the serial WPA phase is com comparable to the thin link and the parallel LTRANS are comparable to thin LTO backends. So let's look at a comparison um, between these different LTO implementations for building the Chromium uh, browser. Um, this is without debug information. And I wanna give the caveat that this was this comparison was done a while ago, and there's been improvements both for LLVM and GCC. Um, and specifically, uh, as I go through these results, I'm gonna show some information that was published um, about some recent GCC LTO improvements so that we can uh, see how that affects the results. We'll look at the peak memory and the time, and I'm gonna break it down by the serial phase, memory and time, and the parallel phase. Uh, so we'll start with LLVM's monolithic LTO. Um, this is without debug. It's fairly large, almost 10 gigs, and it completes in about half an hour. Um, and as I mentioned early on in the talk, Chromium with debug information cannot actually even be built with monolithic LTO. For thin LTO, um, let's, we're looking at, um, here I'm showing the results with eight, 16, and 32 parallel backends. So the serial phase um, doesn't change, obviously, depending on how much parallelism there is in the back end. Um, and it's significantly smaller because again, we're not looking at IR at all. The summaries are much, much more um, compact. Um, the parallel backends uh, are also fairly memory lean and they don't, uh, they don't inc increase much as you increase the, uh, they don't increase as you increase the number of threads. Um, essentially each module is only expanding by a small amount. Um, depending on what you're importing into it. So they stay actually relatively small. Time-wise, um, the thin link is very fast. It's around 30 seconds. That's the serial phase. And the parallel backend time, of course, goes down as you increase the number of threads. Um, and here I didn't go beyond 32 because this was run on a 32 logical core machine. GCC Altrans, um, the serial phase is quite a bit larger. Again, it's looking at IR. So it it's sort of, uh, inherently going to be larger. 
Um, and at the time I did this experiment, the parallel phase peak memory increased quite a bit as you cranked up the number of threads um, because it had to do more cloning for its partitioning. Um, so recently, Hansa, who's the main LVM, uh, sorry, the main GCC LTO developer, published a blog post where he talked about some of the improvements that have been made to GCC's LTO. Um, and he showed that for a Firefox LTO link, uh, the peak memory was about 25% lower. That was because he improved the uh, partitioning. So that was an improvement in the parallel phase peak memory. The serial phase didn't really drop. Um, and in fact, he did do a comparison with thin LTO and the serial phase and therefore the peak memory was about four times, almost four times larger for GCC. On the time front, GCC is slower than thin LTO, but does improve as you increase the number of threads. Um, and here too, he published some uh, recent improvements. So um, a Firefox end-to-end -end LTO link was about 10% faster with GCC 9. Um, and interestingly, so he had done this measurement on an older uh, eight core bulldozer, and he did compare it to thin LTO. And in that case with eight threads uh, for, sorry, eight CPUs, they were actually pretty similar in time. Um, so I, I suspect some of that is because it's a smaller machine. Um, here we can see that uh, GCC is about double um, or more the time of thin LTO. And really, so the one of the benefits of thin LTO is because we're not serial streaming any IR through the serial phase, we're not looking at it at all. And also each LTO backend, it's in terms of its behavior, uh, is, is completely independent of how much parallelism you actually have. So what this means is that you can kind of crank up the parallelism for thin LTO um, to be as large as the number of cores you have available and not actually add any overhead. Um, and so this is the sort of key thing that we take advantage of in distributed builds. So um, if we look at an internal Google application called Add delivery. This is a very large application, thousands of source files. Um, and also the call and reference graph is quite complex for it. We looked at how it scaled as you increase the number of remote nodes available to the distributed build. And we compared that to O2. And you can see that it's a little bit slower than O2 because again, we have that do have that thin serial synchronization step, but it actually scales almost the same as an O2 build. So as you increase the number of nodes, you can take advantage of all of the parallelism um, you have available. And the other thing I wanna note is this application is so large that um, even without debug information, it could, we couldn't uh, complete either LLVM's monolithic LTO or even the serial phase of GCC LTO. And again, that reason the reason is that both of those serial uh, implementations have to, uh, they look at IR. And inherently when you're putting all your IR together in memory, um, you're gonna have a performance issue when you go to really large applications. Okay, so let's look at incremental builds. And um, so in this case, we're looking at a build of the Clang binary itself. So if we're doing a clean build, monolithic LTO is significantly slower, of course, than thin LTO or, or non-LTO. Um, but thin LTO is actually fairly close to a non-LTO build. If you change a function in a, uh, in a header that's widely used, you don't do that much better. I mean, you have to pretty much rebuild almost everything. Um, but it's interesting to look at if what happens when you change a function in a single source file. Um, so for monolithic LTO, of course, you have to rebuild that source file to IR and then redo the entire monolithic LTO portion of the build. For non-LTO, you have to only have to compile that one source file down to native object and then relink. For thin LTO, we have to compile it down to IR, redo the whole thin link, and then redo the single LTO backend action corresponding to that file, and then do the native link. And this takes 16 seconds. Um, so you can really see the power of the support that thin LTO has in it um, in the design for incremental builds when you do this comparison. Um, so let's look at now the runtime performance when you actually build some applications with thin LTO. Um, so this is the spec 2006 benchmarks um, and the baseline here is O2 and everything has profile information. The baseline has profile information and both of the LTO configurations have profile. 
monolithic LTO gets kind of a range of performance improvements depending on the application. But the, the most important thing is thin LTO gets nearly the same performance improvement. Um, I think we're within 2% across the board. All right, so switching gears a little bit, let's talk about how thin LTO is used inside Google. Um, Google switched all of its C++ builds over to LLVM a few years ago in 2017. And um, that's when we initially rolled out thin LTO uh, to produ production. And uh, initially it was only used for the key performance sensitive applications. Um, since that time, however, we've been gradually rolling it out to the rest of the production builds. And as of this past spring, it's now enabled by default for all of our builds uh, targeting production. And so some things that we learned while deploying this really widely. Uh, first of all, thin LTO is really good at exposing user bugs. And um, this is kind of true in general. When you turn on optimization, you can often flesh out user bugs that uh, where people just got by with things without optimization. Um, but with thin LTO, because we're expanding the scope of optimization to be so much broader than the single translation unit, it tends to flush out a lot of other issues. Um, thankfully, the vast majority of them are very easy to identify. And we found a lot of cases where, <clears throat> again, talking about template C++ template uh, function definitions, um, unless they're explicitly instantiated, they need to be in the header file. But there's a lot of code that incorrectly had them defined in source files. Um, even though they were used in other source files. And people kind of got lucky, but once you crank up inlining, which happens when you turn on thin LTO, um, suddenly you have a linker error because your out of line copy goes away. Um, but those are pretty obvious. Um, the linker error points right at the function. And once you've looked at a couple of these, it's very clear what needs to uh, be fixed. Um, much harder, but thankfully much less common are more subtle issues, for example, and lifetime of temporary issues that people got lucky with suddenly become a problem. Um, those runtime errors, crashes, um, and in one weird case, it actually caused a performance issue. Um, so those are less fun to track down, but thankfully not very common. Um, but what we learned is it's really important, especially when you're rolling out a new optimization framework to have really good user troubleshooting documentation so that when people hit problems, they can um, figure out how to fix them uh, and how to work around them. And along with that, we really uh, we needed to have a very easy to use opt-out mechanism so that people can turn off the LTO while they're um, looking at issues. And um, also to avoid those opt-outs, we tried to do as much pre-release testing as possible to try and flush out a lot of these, especially the, the easy linker errors ahead of time and fix them. The other thing that I'll be talking more about is um, build system integration. Um, it's one thing to have a compiler framework that supports distributed builds, um, but you really need to make sure that you integrate this carefully with your build system so that you can take advantage of it and also um, have it work uh, efficiently. So I'm going to talk about how we support hybrid language builds and also um, how we have approached um, thinking about build scalability beyond the scalability of a single target build. Okay, so here I'm showing, again, this is an action graph constructed by Bazel for a small um, thin LTO C++ build. It's pretty common in Google to build multiple targets at the same time. And a lot of times you'll be building C++ targets and also other languages such as Java that um, link in C++ native dependencies. So we added support to um, actually do thin LTO for the native dependencies linked into some of these other languages. Um, a little bit harder to deal with are cases where we have, we're building languages that have essentially a black box linker. Um, when they're linking C++ native dependencies, that's, we don't have a, a clear uh, link action, C++ link action that we can uh, turn into a thin LTO link. Um, so a good example, in our build system is uh, or when we're building Haskell code. So the Haskell compiler knows how to link Haskell code with uh, native ELF objects. Um, but of course, if you're doing a thin LTO build, your objects are not native ELF, they're LLVM IR. So the way that we've supported this 
is we've created another action type called a shared LTO backend. And this shared LTO backend does not have an LTO indexing or a thin link step before it. So there's no whole program decisions being made or applied. We simply are compiling that LLVM IR through the optimization pipeline and the code generation and creating a native ELF so that we can link it in with, that, um, with the Haskell linger. Um, and the important thing here is that this allows us to share actions whenever possible. So no matter what languages we're linking, we can share the C++ compiles down to LVM IR. Um, and we can share those shared LVM backend actions across any target, um, any non-C++ target that's consuming the same, uh, that depends on the same source file. And this sort of leads into the next topic, which is thinking about how the build scales when you're building large numbers of targets together. So thinking of, first, let's look at shared links. And by shared link, I mean when you're uh, linking a lot of your code together into shared libraries and then linking those libraries into your final targets. This is how we build our unit tests um, by default in Google. So in a non-thin LTO build, we can share those compile actions and we can also share the library links. So the libraries, the lib.so here is a native elf and it can be shared by any target that depends on it. For a thin LTO build, we can still share the compiles, which now are compiling to LVM IR. Um, and each CPP link turns into a thin LTO link. So we actually do a mini thin LTO link um, when we generate each shared library. Um, it's not whole program, obviously, because we're just building a shared library, but we can still do cross module optimization, for example, cross module inlining. And the good news is that the library links are still shared. Um, so each lib.so is still shared by, um, we build it a single time and we share it across any target that depends on it. So the scaling here is, is okay. I mean, we're essentially doubling the number of actions, which is sort of expected for a thin LTO build. Uh, but now let's look at what happens when you're building a large number of targets with static links. And what I mean here is that we're not first building um, code into shared libraries. Um, every link, every target link uh, links together everything as individual object files, and except for system libraries, but all of the user code is linked together um, directly um, and fully statically. This is how we build our binaries for production in Google. So for a non thin LTO build, of course, again, you can share the C++ compiles. Um, for a thin LTO build, we can still share the compiles down to LLVM IR. However, you get an explosion of LTO backend actions. And the reason is that each target has its own LTO indexing action, and that is making target specific whole program analysis and, and optimization decisions. So you end up needing a full unique set of LTO backend actions per target. Um, a lot of times we can handle this, but it's, it obviously causes some overhead in our build system that we would like to avoid. So one of the things that we're investigating is whether we can actually share some of the LTO backend actions um, across different targets when the whole program results are the same. Uh, the intuition here is that our binaries tend to link together thousands of source files, but many of them are used similarly. Um, and so, for example, each C++ source file has the same downstream dependencies, no matter which target you're linking them to. So the functions that the LTO will decide to import into it are essentially going to be the same, no matter which target you're linking. Um, so I did an experiment where I linked together 45 related binaries, and I looked at uh, how similar their analysis results files were. So for a single source, source file consumed by these 45 binaries, um, I compared the analysis, you know, the 45 different analysis results files for that, um, for each C++ file across those binaries. And I found that actually almost 70% of them were duplicates of each other. Uh, so to take advantage of this, we need to do a bit of restructuring in the build system. Um, it's not really set up to take advantage of that. And it, because Bazel basically 
uh, wants to know all of the actions that it's going to execute ahead of time, um, we need to do a bit of restructuring to make that a bit more dynamic. But the good news is that we have um, some hope for reducing this overhead. OK, so um, I want to switch to the last topic, which is going through some of the newer thin LTO optimizations and also talking about um, some of the future optimizations that we're looking at. OK, so let's look at virtual calls. Um, here, I have a two-level class hierarchy. And so there's a virtual call foo that's overridden in derived class B, and then a function f that calls foo through a pointer to B. The code that get gener gets generated for this, um, so first of all, you need to load the vtable out of the pointer to B. And this is what it looks like on x86. Then you need to load the pointer to virtual function foo out of the vtable and do an indirect jump to it. And on x86, you can do that in, in a single instruction. Um, virtual calls are costly, not only because of those two loads and the indirect jump, but more importantly, they're a barrier to inlining. Um, and as we recall, um, as I mentioned earlier, inlining is one of the biggest performance benefits we have in the compiler. And so when we can't do inlining here, uh, it can be a big blocker to performance improvement. Ideally, we'd like the compiler to be able to, to divirtualize a call whenever possible. So if the constructor to the object is in scope, potentially after optimization, Clang or LLVM can often um, can divirtualize in that case. Um, also, if the user annotates um, the dec declaration of bfoo with the final keyword, the compiler also knows that it can divirtualize. So for example, if you're linking with a bunch of source files and you know that none of them derive from B or none of them override B foo, it's safe then for the user to annotate foo with the final keyword and the compiler will go ahead and divirtualize. Um, unfortunately, what we see a lot, um, I've seen this a lot in our code in Google, is that there's often a test file that gets linked with the source file and it will actually override with a mock. So in this case, here we've overridden B um, be foo with a mock version of foo. And if we've marked foo with the final keyword, because that benefits our you know, main production binary, unfortunately, when you build the test, now you get a runtime failure. Um, so what we'd like to do is use whole program information to decide for each target whether it's legal to do the whole program, I mean, whether it's legal to do the virtualization. Um, OK, so there is support in LLVM to do whole program to virtualization. It was implemented um, by Peter Kohenberg for um, regular uh, LTO initially. And um, so one of the issues that we have in LLVM is that the LLVM IR does not have a lot of type information. A lot of that is lost after you leave Clang. And so um, for whole program to virtualization with this option, whole program V tables, Clang will annotate the IR with some type information. So for example, it will attach type metadata to the vtables. Um, and this tells the LLVM what types are compatible with the vtable definition. So what, what types can hold a pointer to it? Um, it will also annotate every virtual call in the function with an intrinsic that says, what is the static type of the vtable that we're making this virtual call on? So in the case of the um, virtual call in function f, the type is um, type of b. With thin LTO, what we've done is to now pass along some of this information to the summary. So we've added support to um, augment the summary with the v table type information, um, and also the information about the uh, type intrinsics um, within each function for its virtual calls. Um, because we already have in ThinLTO a full reference graph, we already had an entry summarizing the, you know, each vtable and which virtual functions it referenced. But we need to augment that with the offset of each virtual function within the vtable. So once we do that, we compile all of our code with this option and then pass them to the thin link. Of course, we merge the, all the summaries together and we can perform interprocedural analysis using that information. And I'm not going to go through the gory details here, but essentially, once you collate all of this information, it's pretty straightforward to identify type and offset pairs 
that correspond to a single virtual function implementation. Um, so we just record that in the analysis results. And then when you, you get to the Finelchio backends, they can look at their IR, see that they have a virtual call, see the intrinsic that says what type it is. They can compute the offset from the code in, um, leading up to the virtual call and just look up in the analysis results whether that type and offset pair has a single implementation and go ahead and divirtualize. Um, so that's the mechanics of how we do whole program divirtualization in FinLTO. Um, but let's go back and look again at the question of safety. So if we're linking together everything statically, so we're linking together all of the code as IR objects, then it's safe to assume we've seen the entire class hierarchy. Um, unfortunately, if we're linking into a shared library, obviously it's not safe to assume that we've seen the entire class hierarchy. So what we do is um, Clang also adds an LTO visibility uh, tag to the vtable definitions. And those get propagated to the summary. And then in the thin link, we divirtualize only when we have non-public visibility on the associated vtables. Um, so it will have non-public vi visibility, for example, if the class was declared in an anonymous namespace. Um, or if you compiled your source file with F visibility hidden. The issue here is that in this case where we're linking source files sometimes into a, uh, a in, through a static link and sometimes into a shared library, you need to compile twice because it's only legal to say F visibility hidden in one of those cases. So to address this, um, we have added a new linker option so that the build system, when it is getting to the thin link, it can apply this option at the thin link time when it knows that it's doing a fully static link. And the advantage here, again, thinking about scalability of the build system, is we only need to compile each source file once to IR. We can share those IR objects between links into shared libraries and links into static, um, statically linked targets. Performance-wise, um, so for the C++ benchmarks in spec, we see some, and this again, so here the um, baseline is thin LTO, but with no whole program divirtualization. And we see some nice improvements in particular for Zaylang BMK. Um, let's look at an internal application. Um, this is a very performance critical application. And just to put it in context, 1% improvement is a very huge deal for this application. So the scale is quite a bit smaller here. Um, if, now here again, the baseline is thin LTO, no whole program divirtualization. So let's look at when we have no profile information. We get a really nice speed up, close to 0.8%, which is huge for this application. Um, but being performance critical, it of course uses all the profile information we can give it. And as I mentioned earlier, with profile information, we can do speculative divirtualization of indirect calls. Well, in that case, whole program divirtualization doesn't buy you much on top. Um, however, Using the same whole program class hierarchy analysis in the thin link that we use to make whole program divirtualization decisions, um, we can use that same information and the same analysis to actually guide the speculative divirtualization sequences to be more efficient. And so doing this broader whole program class hierarchy analysis and combining it with speculative, diver speculative divirtualization, we actually see a really nice 0.4% improvement. And this is outside the noise range for this application. This is a really nice uh, speed up. Also, um, the long tail of our fleet uses a special kind of profile called a cross-binary profile, cross-binary FEO. Um, and this profile is basically synthesized from hardware counters that are collected across all the applications running in our fleet. Um, so you can you get a nice improvement from using this profile. But because it's collected across all of the applications, the um, information used to drive, to drive speculative divirtualization, the profiles of the indirect call targets are not very accurate. They're not very target specific. So the good news is that we can actually improve the speculative div divirtualization, improve the div um, overall divirtualization of the applications um, quite significantly if we use whole program divirtualization. And so we're actually looking at rolling this out um, right now. Okay, so last slide. And I just want to go through a smattering of some of the things that we're looking at um, going forward with an LTO. 
Um, first of all, there's a number of opportunities for improving whole program virtualization itself. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, LLVM does not have a lot of type information. We're kind of beholden to whatever information Clang passes down via those intrinsics and the, the type metadata. Um, and one of the issues is that often when you inline, which happens in LLVM, you can, once you've done inlining, you have a more refined type for your V tables. But we can't take advantage of that because the intrinsics inserted by Clang are sort of immutable and we've lost the information that we would need to um, update those to be the more specific type. Um, so there's a couple of approaches for um, improving that and we're looking at those. Um, there's also some opportunities for refining types based on the caller's type. So for example, if the caller is in a, is a method in the same class hierarchy, you can often narrow down um, the possible virtual call targets. Um, I talked about this on the last slide, but the same class hierarchy analysis that we use for virtualization can actually be used for a broader set of optimizations. Um, so what I showed earlier is optimizing the speculative speculative virtualiz virtualization sequences. Um, by default, it can, you speculatively virtualize by comparing virtual function pointers against the possible virtual function targets. Um, but with class hierarchy analysis information, you can um, figure out sometimes it's pro more profitable to compare against the V table um, pointer itself. And that's where I got the improvement on the previous slide. Um, for code size, you can also um, use the whole program class hierarchy analysis to sometimes skip the fallback indirect call. Um, we're also looking at doing cross-module cloning of functions. Um, and this is to support um, other optimizations that are uh, context sensitive and need context sensitive information. And we're also looking at some additional whole program analysis. Um, so specifically, uh, we're looking at some escape analysis um, in a limited form, because again, we don't want to bloat up the summaries too much because we want to keep that thin link very uh, lean and fast. And then another, the last thing um, that I'll mention here is we talked periodically about the idea of having an iterative thin LTO process. Um, so thin LTO right now has a single thin link and then a bunch of parallel backends. There are definitely cases where it would be advantageous to have perhaps a second thin link. So maybe later on during the pipeline to pass around some additional whole program information. Um, so we have some ideas there um, and that's one area that we would like to explore. Um, but obviously that's going to take some work to do some trade off between the build time overhead versus the optimization gain that you can get. Um, so with that, that's the end of my slides. Um, here's my contact information. I'm happy to answer questions later or now, I guess. Um, I think we're going to switch over to yes. Remo to do the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you so much for this great keynote. Um, we are going to go over now in, in Remo, and then just it's one interface for everyone, and we're going to uh, do the Q&A for the keynote there. Thank you.